At the end of last year, my father asked me what I wanted for the year 2019, and my answer was a new shed for the backyard. In the last five years, my husband Tim and I had gotten married, had two kids, both changed jobs and bought a new house, so we were ready for some peace and quiet. We could not in any way have predicted that 2019 would become the most chaotic and challenging year of our lives. But it was also the year we made a little bit of magic happen here in Belgium. This is Pia. She was born in November 2018. The first few months after her birth, our life seemed perfect. An enthusiastic big brother and a sweet little baby girl. But when Pia was about three and a half months old, I started to notice that she wasn't holding her head up as she should. After numerous doctor's visits and further testing, we received a diagnosis at the beginning of May. Pia had SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. SMA is a hereditary muscle disease. Because Pia is lacking a certain gene, she can't move her muscles as she should. Without any treatment, her muscles would deteriorate and eventually die. Also, the lung and heart muscles. Her life expectancy was 18 months, two years at most. Our world shattered to pieces, and the clock started ticking. Luckily, there was already a treatment available here in Belgium that would prolong Pia's life and give her the opportunity to develop a little bit. And it started right away. But her doctor also told us about a new gene therapy called Zolgensma that was recently developed by Novartis. And this gene therapy would put the missing gene into Pia's body. In the weeks after her diagnosis, Tim and I learned more and more about the amazing results that this therapy had had for children who had received it and our minds were made up. We would do anything in our power to get Pia that medicine. At the end of May, the American Food and Drug Administration approved Solgensma, and children living in the United States up to two years old could be treated. In Europe, and more specifically here in Belgium, it would take until the end of 2020 before there would be an approval and an agreement for a reimbursement. By then, Pia would be two years old, and probably too old for the medication to have any effect. So we knew that waiting was not an option. After doing further research and finding out that she couldn't take part in a clinical trial, I found out about a special program that would enable Pia to get the medicine even if she wasn't a US citizen. Our hopes were lifted, but we soon found out that the program wasn't for free. The price tag? was $2 million and more. An unreachable, unrealistic amount of money. To this day, it is the most expensive medicine in the world. So we contacted Novartis and asked them for help, but they said there was nothing they could do. We reached out to the Belgian government, and namely the Minister of Health, pleaded for our daughter's case, but again, they said they couldn't do anything for us. But the love for a child is maybe the strongest drive imaginable, so giving up wasn't an option. We went into fight mode. If neither Novartis nor the government was going to help, we would try to raise the money ourselves. By then we were July, and we started asking friends for help. Someone built a website, we came up with the ID of Team Pia, we set up Facebook and Instagram profiles, and started blogging. But most importantly, we opened up a bank account and a GoFundMe page so we could start to receive donations. We knew immediately that we needed some very big national exposure to get the story out there. So we contacted some national TV networks, but there was very little interest. Only the regional newspaper and TV network here in Antwerp were willing to tell her story. And it worked, because soon after, the donations came in. In a little over two months, we managed to raise 100,000 euros, which we thought was amazing. But it was also only 5% of what we needed. Family, friends and acquaintances started doing actions on their own. They sold wine, made keychains, printed PR labels, and so on. And we were so thankful to anyone who was willing, willing to help us out, but we also knew that we would never get to our amount with this kind of fundraising. What we needed was a way to reach a very large number of people who were willing to donate just a little bit of money. 
So a friend of ours came up with the idea to have people send a text message and receive one back. And that way, they would donate two euros. It's very tech and very low-key. Anyone between 12 and 95 can send a text, right? To be honest, at first, I really didn't believe it would be a success. After all, how do you convince one million people to send a text for yet another charity? And how do you reach so many people in the first place? We needed a plan and go all out. Living in 2019, social media is everywhere. And so, at the beginning of September, we asked our friends to contact every actor, singer, celebrity they knew to share the call to action. And soon, more and more Belgian celebrities started to share text via on their Facebook and Instagram accounts. Models, actors, DJs, soccer players, there was not a single celebrity who had the audacity not to share Team Pia. And with every one of them, thousands of their followers did the same. And soon, Team Pia was everywhere on social media, and we were trending on Twitter for days. Once the social media train was on its way, the traditional media followed. Tim and I were overwhelmed with requests from TV networks, radio stations, and news agencies to give interviews. The next few days, in kind of a blur. It was a combination of checking how many messages we had received and doing interviews for TV and the radio. In a little over 48 hours, one million people, one million, joined Team Pia by sending a text. And we had reached our goal and even gathered more than we needed for the medicine. And on October 9th, Pia received a treatment here in Belgium. <laughs> So, two million in 48 hours. A lot of people wondered how we pulled that off. I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but let's give it a try. I think there were two quintessential factors, involvement and connection. People were immediately involved in the story. They didn't even need to be parents themselves to understand that the father and mother would do anything to help their child, even ask the community to contribute. It was a story of David versus Goliath, little baby Pia against the big pharma industry and a government that said its hands were tied. And is there a greater cause than to help save the life of a baby? But people were also proud to be part of Team Pia. They were proud to say that they had sent a text and even asked their family, friends and colleagues to do the same. We noticed that Belgian people needed a story of hope and positivity in a time where they are confronted on a daily basis with bad news on the internet and on television. It made people feel empowered. People said, if the government and pharma industry do nothing, we will just do it ourselves. And we used maybe the easiest way possible for people to donate, modern technology. Anyone can send a text, or two, or maybe three. You don't feel it right away in your wallet because you will just pay your bill at the end of the month. So let's send another five texts tomorrow. But as much as we had tried to direct how everything would go, we were also lucky in some ways. There was no other major news that week. The media picked up on Pia's story and followed up on it every day. This newspaper even had a banner on its front page showing how many messages we had already received. But most of all, we were very lucky to have some friends working in marketing, communication and design who were willing to help us out. They made the design for Team Pia, and they helped us with the blogging and updated our social media in real time. So no, we didn't hire a professional marketing team to help us out, but we did have the help of a lot of good friends. And that was our strength. You don't need 100 volunteers to help you out, but you do need a small team with good ideas and the willingness to help to work them out. We are now almost two months after PS treatment, and I've had some time to reflect on everything. I've asked myself the question, was it worth it, a couple of times. First off, we truly learned about the power of both social and traditional media. They picked up on Pia's story and made it go viral. We reached hundreds of thousands of people that way, and we were really grateful and tried to accommodate everything, everyone. But it's the sort that cuts both ways. 
when Pia's story became so well known, she, al she also became everyone's baby, a little bit of public domain. And everyone wanted to know how she was doing and how much progress she was making. But we as parents didn't feel inclined to share every aspect of our personal lives and give daily updates. Even now, we still feel the pressure to share how much progress Pia is making so people can see that their money was well spent. After her diagnosis, I went to bed every night thinking that I wanted, no, that I needed to do everything in my power to give my daughter every chance to a full life. And I bet you $2 million that every other parent would do the same thing. But it took a high toll as well. Whenever Tim and I weren't working or taking care of the kids, we were doing interviews, making phone calls, sending emails, or having meetings. We lacked sleep, didn't eat enough, and didn't make time for each other or ourselves. All that mattered was Pia and getting her the gene therapy. And everything and everyone else came second. In the end, it was worth it for us because we succeeded, but it were a rough couple of months. With the crowdfunding that we organized, we didn't only raise the money that we needed, but we also caused a bit of an uproar here in Belgium. Within the Belgian public, but also with scientists, economists, politicians, and so on. The call for the big pharmaceutical companies, like Novartis, to change their price-setting policies in the future was massively supported. Pia's story breached the Belgian borders and even caused the same turmoil abroad. And we were very happy that these issues were raised. We were proud that we had put a disease like SMA on the map and that people started to rethink how these new, new medicines and therapies should be funded in the future. I can only hope that those responsible will take this opportunity to make some fundamental changes. 2019 was by far the craziest year of my life. It was a roller coaster of the steepest highs and the deepest lows. So for 2020, I wish that everything can go back to normal just us for being the best us we can be. And that garden shed. In 2020, we need to make that garden shed happen. I'm really happy and really grateful that I can think about garden sheds again. Thank you for listening. And And let me, let me take this opportunity to say thank you all for making the impossible possible. Thank you. <laughs>